Okay, welcome back. In this tutorial, we're going to be looking at storyboarding for animation. So um, it's not really much different from storyboarding for um, film or uh, you know telling stories with live action film. Um, but in this circumstance, it is purposefully for an animation. So maybe there are some differences here and there. Um, but anyway, I want to get straight into it and and tell you guys some. Um, uh, some of my experiences with storyboarding for animation, but also to give you some tips that I've learned along the way. This was the storyboarding for my um, short film called Wild Fur, which uh, recently was released on my channel, uh, which you can go and watch here. So my approach to storyboarding is pretty simple. I think it is simple in most cases. So um, a few of the principles that are going through my head right now um, uh, during this process, obviously right now I'm talking in like looking back on it because this is this was actually the process that I used for the storyboarding not like this wasn't done afterwards so um, what you're seeing is actually what goes on to become the finished result um, the polished finished result so it starts with these very rough sketches um, notice how I'm not paying attention to detail when I draw the trees and stuff like that I just kind of scribble them out I, I get a vague idea for what it is and um, I'm basically trying to get what's in my head, like what's playing through my head. I visualized it all in my head. I do it generally when, you know, uh, if I'm at the supermarket buying food or, or walking to, uh, to the gym or, or somewhere like that, I'm using that time uh, where I'm, I'm alone with my thoughts. I use that time to um, try and concentrate on the, the, the visuals of the animation that I can see in my head. And then when I get back and I can draw, um, then I just try and get them down onto the paper and uh, well, or in this case onto the screen so um, detail doesn't really matter because detail is what you're going to be doing uh, in the end but uh, maybe certain specific details like uh, if if you want them to pay attention to the character's face or something like that then that is important um, but what I want to stress is that Composition is king. So, um, in the storyboarding process, the main thing you're going to be concentrating on is composition. So, the composition is like the the, the placement of things in your scene, um, the general uh, layout of the scene, what what goes where and why. <laughs> and um, aside from that, uh, aside from composition, it's also like you want to set the pace and the mood. So, you're going to be thinking about the continuity between um, storyboards. So um, one recommendation I have is when you're making one storyboard, pay attention to the storyboard that came before it and the storyboard that's going to come after it. And that way you can get a sense of continuity for um, your drawings. So for example, um, one of the things I like to do, I don't do it in every case because sometimes it's not appropriate, but in a lot of cases I like to um, I, I like to if if the characters one of the characters' faces is uh, in a certain section of the the third grid, um, if if it's in one of those sections, I will try to have the next character's face in the next composition be in the same position. Obviously, these don't need to be detailed; they can be rough. Um, the lines don't matter because you're going to be drawing over them later. But I would say. Even though they're going to be rough, I'd say spend as long as you can to get them right. So get get them to feel good. Uh, that doesn't mean necessarily uh, get all the details down. It just means like get the 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 characters looking how you want them to look, um, and most importantly, get the composition how you want it to look, um, so that when you first uh, click onto that image. Um, your eye is immediately drawn to the thing that you want it to be drawn to and not something else that's distracting from that. Um, there's a few other things to avoid like tangents and, and uh, stuff like that but th that's the main one. You, you want there to be guiding lines towards uh, certain things. And it doesn't have to be guiding lines. So th there's a lot of different ways that you can draw attention to certain things within the frame. And I'll try and list off as many as I can now uh, just really quick but if you want to read into more detail I do recommend um, either Framed Ink by Marcus Matthew Mestre 
or uh, Dream Worlds by Hans Batcher. They're two excellent books that I own and I fully recommend them. So here's a few ways that you can uh, direct the audience attention to what you want in the scene. So uh, the first one, which is probably the most obvious one, is direction lines. So um, in nature, there, there are natural lines towards things um, and you can get them to line up with what you want in a scene um, and that way it's almost like acting as an arrow which is pointing towards what you want to see. Um, so the probably the easiest direction line that you're going to have in most of your scenes is your horizon line. So use your horizon line to your advantage. Get the horizon line perhaps, uh, you, you know, you can get your horizon line paired up with the character's eye line or something like that. Or put something on the horizon line using foreshortening and, and that, all that stuff and that can really help. Another, uh, another thing is to distinguish what you want them to look at with color. So uh, choose uh, a certain color palette for the scene, but then choose one bold color that you want to stand out, and and that will immediately just draw your viewer's eye, the viewer's eye to that uh, that thing that you want them to see. Usually, it's a character because in well, it depends what your story is about. But in my stories, they're generally about characters, so you want them to be focused on the character. There are also scenes in my animations where I uh, don't have any characters present and those scenes are generally so that I can establish the setting and, and show something else. So when there's no characters in there it allows the viewer some more time to um, take in the scenery and, and, and uh, enjoy the context of it. So, so you want them to uh, maybe first pay attention to where this story is set and then pay attention to the characters so that's what I like to do um, and that's uh, it's a clear example in, in this animation that I made I start off with no real characters uh, being the focus of the animation but then as I've uh, after I've done a big shot setting the scene which goes on for a long time then I introduce the characters after that so we we're given the kind of scenario the um, the setting and then we drop the characters into the setting that's how I like to do it however you can do it the opposite way around so you can introduce the characters first and you can have the audience not know where they are so that's another way of doing it um, there's plenty of different ways to choose from uh, of course these are just general principles they're not rules like uh, even if they are rules rules are made to be broken so you don't have to stick to any of these rules but they are principles that can help you out and I have found that they helped me out during this um, so anyway back to the uh, the ways you can draw focus to uh, to something in your scene so we we had directional lines and and color you can also use lens focus so you can emulate a lens effect um, on your animations either in uh, post-production like After Effects or in Flash itself by using the blur tool so so you can blur out the background so then it sharpens the foreground um, and I like to use that <coughs> and I like to use that occasionally for um, uh, when I'm making up a composition sometimes I'll label something as like this will be blurred out or something like that um, and I find that that just um, it, it, it just helps to um, get the get the audience to look at what you want them to look at and it's a very easy way. You just select what you want to be blurred and blur that in movie clip symbols if you're in Flash. And um, and then don't blur what you want to what you want the audience to focus on. It's very easy. And um, unlike in live action, you have the freedom to do that very easily without mm, any equipment or anything like that. Um, so the other one is high contrast. So this is a bit like color, but it's not color. It's it's the um, it's the contrast. So the contrast is um, when you have uh, something very bright and very dark right next to each other, that's high contrast. If you have something very in the middle grey next to something that's only a slight variation of that grey, that's low contrast. So they, it's like two things with the same brightness. So that's like no contrast there. But if you have very light with very dark uh, it pulls the audience's eyes to that and lots of traditional painters use that in a lot of their uh, compositions so they'll have the, the main focus of the piece 
will have uh, very light very, areas of very light and areas of very dark. Um, so yeah, that's they're, they're the main ones I I use. There are other ones as well, I'm sure that I have missed out, but um, I really like to use them. Um, and also, of course, a really easy thing that you can use to help you with all of this is your rule of thirds grid. So um, occasionally I have toggled on and off a thirds grid. I don't know if I've done it in, in this one particularly. There's a few, I, I try to only use it when I, I actually need it. But there's a few compositions where I decided I want to use the third grid to just make this really sharp. So um, to use the third grid, you just put it on in the background and you draw over it. Um, and I had the owl's face in one of them like line up with one of the thirds uh, lines and it just creates a really clean composition which is very easy to focus on and, and looks very visually appealing um, and in that same piece I'll, I'll bring it up now um, in that same uh, composition I also had like the trees and, and forest foliage um, arranged in a certain way which gave breathing space around the owl so the owl wasn't necessarily like bunched in with the trees it was kind of separate separate from the trees so I found that helped um, yeah so th there's two other things I want to um, cover on this which I think are really important when you're um, trying to storyboard out your animation so the first one is left to right or right to left or up and down. So this is something um, that I had never heard talked about before in any lessons and any, any classes or anything like that, any tutorials. And I only came across this problem when I was actually making my own uh, storyboards. And now I think I'm going to try and talk to, about it but it's quite a tricky uh, thing to talk about because I, I don't really know how to explain it but um, basically I'll try and explain it in this way um, so in in this case and in a lot of cases in a lot of films your characters are not stationary they're not in the same place they're moving from one place to another and to orchestrate that move from one place to another can be quite difficult um, and what has helped me is to create a level of consistency um, in that uh, the characters are moving in the, in the same direction across all the storyboards. So you may have noticed if you're paying attention in the, uh, in the short film Wild Fur, which is now on my channel, um, that the characters um, are always almost always moving from left to right in almost every shot and this creates like a nice consistency it can be a little bit predictable perhaps um, but if they were moving from left to right in all the scenes and then uh, in certain scenes they were moving from right to left I think it might uh, disorientate the uh, the viewers into not really understanding what's going on whereas if they're if the character moves from right to left in all of the shots, it's a bit like the 180 uh, degree rule but taken in, in, in into direction. Um, and I think I learned this best, I, I found this out best from watching and deconstructing a scene in Shrek. Um, it's a scene where they travel in a horse and carriage from one scene to another and it's like a montage of, of traveling. However, they have certain shots with with beautiful composition in each shots they're excellent composition but how they link up is that they they fade through to each shot right but wherever the next shot starts there the uh, horse and carriage is in the same position as in the last shot where it where it left off so you get this uh, linear movement that is represented throughout all of the shots and it's like really well done and you wouldn't notice it unless you were paying attention to it and I try to emulate the same thing in my animation and I think it did pretty well because for once I felt like um, the 
compositions weren't confusing. They were easy to understand because they were always moving from left to right. So they, it was a lot easier. Like your brain has less of a task like mapping out where they're moving according to which direction the camera's in. Like your brain doesn't have to do that. So um, I, I don't know. I'm going to have to like edit in some footage to kind of explain that bit. I don't know because um, it's quite a difficult concept for me to explain verbally. Um, anyway, you don't want the viewer to get disorientated. So how I do that, um, how you can do that very easily, which I probably should have done um, in this animation. I think it would have helped me out a lot. Um, just what, what I would suggest is making a simple map or diagram of the the location that you have in your animation um, and refer to it when you're making the storyboards. So I didn't actually do this, but I wish I had. So um, especially like in uh, inside buildings. So inside the vehicle, I want I, I should have like mapped out the corridor and, and where it was uh, within the, the, the vehicle itself. And also in the outer location, like it, where the river was running by and stuff like that. I should have like actually mapped that out in a simple diagram and then referred to that as I was uh, doing it. And, and yeah, so that's another uh, tip and that will help for you to get less confused when you're doing the storyboards. And it also helps your viewer to be less confused when they're actually watching it. So I just remembered that I uh, forgot about explaining how to do this in Flash. Uh, even though I don't think it needs much explaining because it's a very simple tactic to do. So uh, all I do is I just have one layer. I keep it to one layer or two layers at the max, but really you don't really want to go into layers. You want it all on the same one uh, with just a big thick brush. I like to use a big flat brush um, <clears throat> uh, with one or two colors at the max. You don't need a lot of colors, but maybe if the color is important in the scene, you can note down a color or two, but color takes a long time. so. I, I would leave that to another stage, um, but you you have it all there on one layer, and you just make keyframe after keyframe. Uh, so you just make a string of blank keyframes and just put them onto that. And um, I'll talk about how to develop that from a simple storyboard like that into the animatic stage, which is the next stage. I'm going to explain that in a later video, but right now uh, that's all you really need to do for the storyboarding. So I was going to go into the numbering system um, for this because the numbering system is a really uh, good way to uh, make your animation within a certain time schedule. Um, but I think I'm running out of time to actually explain the numbering system. Um, so I'll have to leave it for another video. But it's basically a way to um, decide which of your storyboards you should keep and which of your storyboards you should scrap. Um, but I'll have to get into that in another video. Uh, so anyway, I hope you found this resourceful and if you like this video, please subscribe to the channel. I've got a lot more videos like this coming out in the near future. Um, please give the video a like and comment if you have any questions and I'll see you in the next video. Circle or a rectangle or something. So it's good to first like do an observational drawing of uh, your character and then break it down into like key um, shapes. And then you, you, you find that when you do that, you're able to reconstruct those shapes in 